We're very pleased to have here today with us Mark Feifel. And introducing Mark Feifel is the chair of our MA program in information operations, Kevin McCarty. Okay, thank you all for coming. Um, we've got Mr. Mark Feifel here, who is a good friend of mine. He and I served together on the National Security Council under President George Bush, the 43rd, where we did some really interesting things with uh, communications, not propaganda, communications uh, that had to do with the Iraqi surge that were very effective. Um, I was a little bit like the idea guy. What Mark is going to talk to you about, we give him a little introduction, he's going to talk to you about how you actually make something happen. Having a good idea is not enough. It's actually a lot of work to make something happen. Uh, for those of you that were in my course in the spring, you've heard me talk about this, so it'll, it'll be new to you. For those of you on my course now, you'll be hearing more about it. So with further ado, Mr. Mark Feifel. Hello, everybody. How are you today? Good morning. Well, I want to thank Frank Fletcher for helping organize uh, this lecture, and also, of course, to Kevin McCarty, my friend and colleague and uh, battle buddy and, and uh, partner at times in trying to make things happen. And thank you, of course, all of you for joining us here today. A um, couple of disclaimers before we begin. Uh, first of all, the debate on should we have gone into Iraq or not, I don't know. Uh, in hindsight, probably not, but uh, it's not. Uh, if we want to debate that, let's get together tonight at happy hour and figure that one out. Would it have been good for Saddam to still be in power, be a bulwark against Iran if he wasn't executed in December of 2006? Um, would the Iranian uprising of 2009 have, uh, the, the Arab Spring of 2011, would it have spread to Iraq like it did to Tunisia and, and Egypt and other places? I don't know. My debate will talk about how the decisions were made after that, years after that, in the surge, and more importantly, how do you get success and how do you come home? hopefully. And one more caveat, a couple more caveats. Some of the names have been redacted to protect the innocent and the guilty. Uh, I've tried redacting my own name, but it makes getting speaking gigs like this a little bit more difficult. So with that, you'll see that there's some things that get in the, min in the minutia of, of policy and implementation where you've got to kind of go into some detail for it. And so bear with me in those process. The the true masterminds and the implementers of the surge in Iraq 2007, 8, and 9 were General David Petraeus, the commander of multinational forces Iraq, and Ryan Crocker, the U.S. ambassador to Iraq at about that same time. Um, but I'm easier to schedule, and I'm cheaper, so you're stuck with me today. Also, the success of the surge, when it happened, was thanks to the men and the women in the field and the military that were training the Iraqi security forces, that were raiding the terror cells, that were partnering with the communities, the civilians that went into the provincial reconstruction teams and lived in the communities, those are the people that made the surge a reality during that snippet in time. They did it. Washington, in many times, where Kevin and I were located, we were kind of a deterrent to their activities, and what we tried to do was give them an avenue to flow so they could get their work done. To many Americans, um, there were too many Americans and Iraqis and coalition forces that were injured in Iraq. There were 4,848 U.S. military that lost their lives in Iraq. And thousands are in harm's way today. I think about 4,000 soldiers and, and mar uh, Marine and airmen are in Iraq right now, probably more than that with facilitators and, and whatnot. And it's in their memory here that I'm with you. And our, our hope is, is that if I, we can talk the message about how to implement good, solid, strong, effective policy in Washington that will make our next challenges, and hopefully as you work in these challenges and, and you are part of this process, that we'll have success and less unfortunate uh, situations like we're in Iraq still today with the rise of ISIS. Okay, so let's take a step back in a time machine and how did we get here? How did I get here? Early days, quick trip down memory row, flow with me here for a second. My family was a, on my father's side, a car dealer. My mother's side, we had uh, newspapers. So I am both a used car salesman 
and a journalist. Not real popular. Add to that a lifetime in politics, and I probably hold the record for the most hated person in the world. But it's good to be here, and thank you for being here today. Um, Mrs. Schlott's second grade class, my uh, teacher, uh, Mrs. Schlott, she had parent-teachers conferences. And she uh, talked to my mother and said, well, you know, Mark, he's not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but he's OK. He's getting by. Um, one of the challenges that he has is that he, uh, he makes fun of the president in class. And, and it really it kind of makes me uncomfortable that he does that. So my mom came home that, that afternoon, and she said, uh, Boy, what is this with, with you and making fun of the president? And I said, well, mother, I don't know what you're talking about. I think the teacher might be having a crisis in confidence. You could see early on, I was thinking about the president and, and policy and how we could get things, uh, how, how we could make an impact. So went to the University of North Dakota, uh, not exactly a hotbed for foreign policy debate, but it's really what you do with it in, in, in your college, in your university years, in, in around that time. And I did a number of internships, uh, got a lot of experience, and that was kind of my early time of figuring out how do you, how do you make a message sell? I worked for the local radio station where we had our, our, uh, our, our number one uh, advertiser was a restaurant, the l and restaurant. We had to find ways to make messages succinct and marketing effective. So the l and restaurant had very good uh, chicken, very good roasted chicken. So I came up with, uh, with the phrase, if the colonel would have had the l and recipe for roasted chicken, he would have been a general. Things like that. Let's, let's think outside the box. We're trying to sell chicken here, $3 spots. And so it's kind of developing those marketing techniques, developing those, those communication techniques to, to um, reach an audience and to, to develop some change in, in their behaviors was early on. First taste in developing and executing a strategy was in 1997 when I was a local hire for FEMA. And our community at that point in Grand Forks, North Dakota was completely underwater with, uh, with, a, flood, with a big flood, a, a 100 year flood. And they said at that point, when I was just finishing up my schooling at the University of North Dakota, and they said you can either take whatever grade you have right now, because there's six weeks left in the semester, or you can come back, take your final exam, and we'll give you that grade. I just said goodbye, everybody. <laughs> Sayonara, give me whatever grade I had. I think I had a gentleman C in geography, and I just took it and ran. But the one job that was available was working for FEMA as a local community hire, community relations person. And it was that first time where I got that, that, that involvement in working with people and in policy and activities on the ground. And ever since then, I've been hooked on that. On that uh, that's the adrenaline. That's the endorphin. That's what, what gets me out of bed in the morning is finding ways to to improve the world, to improve the country, to improve your fellow citizens. And, and it, my, my advice to, to all of you, especially the students, is find that what makes you go, what, what makes you jump out of bed in the morning, what makes the blood flow, what, what, and because and, you're going to have to work somewhere between, well, if you're Kevin, you work seven or eight hours a day. But the rest of us, we're probably working, you know, eight, 10, 12 hours a day. So find that thing that you really like to do and, uh, and, and Find a way so that you get somebody to pay you for it. So I, I moved to Washington, D.C. Uh, my friend Robert said you should move to Washington, D.C. because you really love politics and policy and communications. I think he was probably trying to get rid of me and get me out of the state, but I applied for four internships. So North Dakota, complete Democratic delegation at that point. It was Dorgan, Conrad, and Pomeroy. And I applied for three internships with my delegation. I got three rejection letters. I applied for an internship at the Republican National Committee. They took me in. Therefore, that's why I'm standing here as a Republican from North Dakota, because there were no other places to go. So for students out there, find your opportunities. You've got you to throw a lot of lines out there to find out where, the, where your activity is and, and where you can achieve what you want to achieve. And go ahead and do that. You've got to throw a lot of lines out there to find out what you want to do. So from there, went into crisis management, telling stories, finding solutions. I, became the, the Interior Department, very domestic policy, domestic uh, federal lands, wildlife refuges, offshore drilling, 
Endangered Species Act and worked on those issues in a crisis management uh, situation as the press secretary. 9-11, um, I was sent to um, New York City to the Navy Pier and was helping out FEMA again for about two months after 9-11 and lived out of a hotel and traveled every day to the, the site of the World Trade Center and was helping out uh, officials in, in that capacity. Hurricane Katrina happened. I, you're gonna see, this is kind of a theory here. Wherever the, wherever the crisis is of the day, I'd usually show up and go, hi, here to help. Good to see you. Glad you're here. And they kind of look at me and go, oh no. When this guy shows up, things are not going real well. And 9-11, Social Security uh, reform, Katrina, went to Homeland Security Department and to the FEMA headquarters and, uh, and, and helped out FEMA where I could as well during, during that time in 2005. That was over and Iraq was a mess. So I was sent to uh, the National Security Council and to the White House to set up an Iraq fusion cell. And I, anybody here ever worked in a fusion cell? Know what it is? They throw a bunch of people in a room and say, go do this, because it's a big problem. We don't know what to do about it. So they threw about five of us into a room, gave us some computers, laptops, printer, internet access at the EOB, and had us try and put a plan together. Uh, we did, but it was 2005, 2006. There were huge problems in Iraq. And uh, we still didn't have that, that surge solution that, that would come about in the winter of 2006. So I made my first trip to Iraq in June of 2006, I was working for DOD, and I was headed to Iraq through Amman, Jordan. Now before you can get into uh, the country in a war zone like Iraq or Afghanistan, you have to get approval from the commander of the forces in that country. At that point it was General George Casey. General George Casey had seen a lot of people from Washington coming in, trying to fix things fix things from Washington. Usually they come into the country, they, they uh, get the nice, the nice accoutrement, they meet with everybody, they tell everybody how messed up it is, and then they, ha they get on a Blackhawk and they go back to Washington, D.C., and they go skiing in Aspen. So he had been through this before. And I was in Amman, Jordan, and I was not getting country clearance from General Casey to get into Iraq to do an assessment and to help out their strategic communications and their overlay of psychological information, public affairs, and other activities that they have going on. And three days went by, could not get country clearance. I get, again, I think because General Casey thought another Washington guy coming in. At the morning battle update the, that they do every morning in, in a war zone usually, General Casey is there with his, with his chief of staff. In the middle of all the commanders, they said, hey, General Casey, your buddy from Washington still stuck in Amman. They had a laugh about it. At that same time, the next morning, I go in to uh, get some coffee at the Amman Hotel and uh, open up the only English, new in only English language newspaper. There's a story on the front page about how there was a trial starting for a suicide bomber. And the suicide bomber had tried to ignite herself in a, in a hotel and that, that she was now um, facing trial and probably execution if she's convicted, and it happened at the, at the Radisson Hotel in Amman. Looked down at my coffee cup and, oh, it's the Radisson Hotel. I'm in Amman. I'm in the hotel that the suicide bomber tried to blow up a couple of weeks ago. And I saw this is how messed up our war policy is right now that I can't get into the country to help the war effort that's ongoing, the commanding general of the Iraqi forces said, yeah, just let them wait a while, let them wait it out. And I was thinking, you know what? This hotel blows up. I'm gonna haunt him every day for the rest of my life. Thankfully, we got back and got into Iraq and it was really a, 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 a look at all of the challenges that there are in Iraq and I made that commitment there and then that I wasn't going to become one of these people that goes into a war zone, eats the, the lobster and the, and the roast beef on Thursdays, 
and then flies back and complains about everything. Because there were too many of those people that came through. And what I tried to do at that point was do an analysis of, of the, overall, the ch overall challenges. And, and so then the, the one thing on the, on the one pager that, that we put together, it's called go to the source. So when you're, when you're going through a foreign policy challenge, ask questions, don't be a big shot, be humble, always give honest, thoughtful counsel to the decision makers. And so I came back from Iraq on that trip and the surge in Iraq was uh, announced on January 5th. Well, I, I was announced as the deputy NSC on January 5th. January 6th, I was on a plane back to Iraq. I flew commercial, by the way, if there's any questions. I don't know, today, I guess they can all fly. Government planes, I don't know, but flew commercial and um, it showed up at the, at the, uh, at the airport in Kuwait, and there was nobody to meet me. So I looked around and wondered where everybody was. I thought there'd be a placard with my name on it. There wasn't, so I got in a cab and uh, drove to the, to the U.S. Air Base in, uh, in Kuwait City. If you want to get an interesting um, arrival, show up in a U.S. Air Base during a time of war in a Muslim country in a regular everyday cab, the security at the at the base, did not know what to do, but showed up, got onto the, rolled into the, into the, into the base, got into the, into a rock, and what they were all thinking was, here's another guy coming from Washington, D.C., I'm here to help you with the 4,000 mile um, screwdriver. So there were, and there were other instances of this where people would come through and it just didn't work. There was, there was a, a member from a Vice President Cheney's office who came and, and he did an assessment in the fall of 2005. And he came back and said, it's all a mess. I said, well, would you put it in a report so that we can fix this? He said, I, I, I don't wanna put it in a report because I'm afraid if I do, it'll leak out to the media. Like, yeah, well, everything leaks out to the media. And I don't think there's any question of whether or not Iraq's in a really good place right now. If you've seen the news with Brian Williams or any, Charlie Gibson or anybody else or opened up a, a national newspaper. So what, what I learned from that is, first of all, put together a plan that you're going to, that you're going to operationalize. Speak truth to power and give an honest reaction of what you saw and then follow up, because what didn't happen was there was no follow up from that time of when people would go to Iraq, and I was trying to break that cycle. And when I got to Iraq, there, 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 there were huge challenges. They, they, had a, they had an inventory of products, and they would put out a huge amount of different products of everything every day from what was the multinational force Iraq um, communications infrastructure. And they put out a product every day that had a daily PowerPoint of photos that were online from Reuters or the Associated Press or Agency um, uh, Press France or all these other sources. They'd take the photos from the web, they'd cut and paste it into a PowerPoint, and then they'd send it to everybody. And they, they paid somebody to leave their family in the United States, move to Baghdad to put together a PowerPoint that could have been put together in Washington, D.C. or at the Pentagon or any other place. So I did an inventory of all of the, all the products that were put out. And when I mentioned that it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to have the, the, the big uh, PowerPoint every day where you got some poor guy, that's his job. They said, well, but that's, that's what we do. I said, let's take a step back and see who uses this product. Is it useful? Is it making America safer? Is it making troops safer? Is it bringing more security to Iraq? And if not, let's cut it out and let's find something useful to do. So inventory those types of things when you're going through any type of process or any type of a, of, of a situation and find out are your resources being spent effectively and if they're not, find a way to fix it because it's, it's a burdensome to the taxpayers. Um, also, th there was not a communication engagement structure. So once in a while, the commanding general of Iraq would do a small media engagement, but there wasn't 
a codified real campaign to talk about why we're there, what we're doing, what's going right, what's going wrong, what we're doing to fix what's going wrong, and giving the straight scoop. So we put together a team in Baghdad of not just the commanding general, at that point it would be General Casey, but the brigade commanders, the diplomats that are working in the different areas of the embassy, the provincial reconstruction team members that are scattered all across the country. We made them the spokesman. Because at that point, President Bush, Vice President Cheney, Secretary Rumsfeld, Secretary Rice, National Security Advisor Hadley, were not seen as great messengers because there had been too many stories of how we were going to be treated as, as the liberators. So we had to put together a new information uh, campaign on the public affairs side. Next, there wasn't a real coordination between what was going on in information operations, which is kind of on the, the gray side. What, are you, what messages are you delivering to your, to your enemy to af affect their behavior and change it? The psychological operations, public affairs, and the other elements. And I tried to bring it all together so that, so that the, the messages that were being heard in the country were also the same types of messages were delivered to the American population and to our, to our allies, and the same messages that were being heard by the enemy to get them to change their behavior. And try, tried every way I could to coordinate that, that effort. So, um, the other thing is, is um, we try to get the right people in the right spots. And, and that's another thing to think about is, is you, you, you plan and you write and you execute your plan, but you've got to have the right people in the right spots. So what would happen in, in, in Iraq and, and to a degree in Afghanistan as well is the next guy who was a brigadier general who was off the line, they'd pick his name out of a hat. They'd say, hey, guess what you're going to do? Well, what am I going to do? Am I going to go drive tanks? Am I going to... Um, command a squadron of F-16s, what am I going to do? Nope, nope, nope. Uh, well, what's, what's my next job? You're going to become the spokesman for the war in Iraq. I've, I've never done a news conference. I'm, I did my local paper one time. And we'd move these people, and also to a degree in the embassy, to be the embassy spokespeople. We'd put these people in the most difficult communications challenge in the world because their name came up. And they would usually... Sometimes they would adapt real quickly and become real good at communicating. Other times, there, w there was a Navy uh, pilot, Air Force pilot, who was one of the most decorated Air Force pilots. He, he was Tom Cruise from, from Top Gun, essentially. And they moved him in to become the spokesman for multinational forces Iraq. And he did one press conference and completely bombed. And every time that they'd talk about him engaging with media, he'd start to twitch. I'm like, this guy's never going to be able to fly again. <laughs> what have we done? So we changed the process of let's go and let's find a brigadier general, a one-star or a two-star general who can communicate. Because this is not the time for, for taking somebody just out of, the, just out of college and, and bringing them to the wizards and saying, hey, you're going to start. Good luck. And we, so we found the best, the best generals and the best uh, embassy spokespeople who had some experience, who understood how to communicate, who understood how to coordinate different messages to different audiences. And we trained and we worked with them before they headed to the battlefield. And we just beat the daylights out of them in a, in a closed kind of a mock session so that no matter what we would do talking to them, it wouldn't be as bad as when they were actually talking to Chris Matthews or Al Jazeera or Larry King. Larry King, he's not on anymore, is he? I don't know. I don't think so. Is he? He's still alive, though, right? In infomercials, yes, infomercials for dietary products. So he's still, he's still kicking. Um, next thing is, and, and this is also on, on the sheet of paper, is uh, align your validators. So we didn't have a lot of spokespeople, and a lot of them had fallen off of the good ship a war in Iraq. So what do Al Franken, Thomas Friedman, Josh Marshall, Peter Beinhart, Dick Cheney, Anne Marie Slaughter, Bill Keller, Glenn Greenwald, Hillary Clinton, and George W. Bush all have in common. Any guesses? 
Any guesses? They all supported the war in Iraq as it was just beginning the process, or they were just talking about it. And with a few exceptions of those names, all of them had fallen off the bandwagon in a, in a big way in many cases. So we had to set up what, what I called the, the, the validator campaign to find 50 people, individuals, uh, retired military, uh, bloggers, um, um, thought leaders, think tank people, think like, like the gentleman back here in, in, the, in the back of the row from, from uh, Daniel Morgan, who are thought leaders who can talk and deliver our message, who, who have not fallen off of that bandwagon. Or if they have fallen off, let's re-engage the conversation and get them back so that we're not just talking to ourselves with three people. So we set up a surrogate operation for, for U.S. And, and international officials. So I, I called down to the White House political office and I said, do we, have a, do we have a list of surrogates who can talk about what we're doing in Iraq? Yes, we do. Wow, okay. I've <laughs> never seen it. Huh? Uh, no, we have it. We have it. We have it. I said, okay, well, can you send it to me? Oh, yeah, I'll send it right to you. So a couple of days later, they sent a list, and it was a spreadsheet. I think it was from the 2000 or the 2004 Bush for President campaign of retired military officers. And our fusion cells started going through it, and, and they called me up, and they said, uh, we've got a problem. I said, well, well what, what's our problem? They said they have a, they have a list. I said, well, uh, the first five names of people are dead. Okay, well, is, what about the next five names? Well, they no longer support the war. I don't even want to ask what about the next five names. Well, the next five names, uh, well, they're still alive, but they haven't heard from us in six years. <laughs> Uh-oh. So from scratch, we had to set this system up and go. So as you're putting your plan together and, and you're working on your foreign policy or your policy initiative is look for those 50 people. And then the next thing is how are you going to engage these people so that they're part of the process. Now, different people get information in different ways. Some people are local, so we, we utilize the, the, uh, the situation room and kind of the, all the accoutrement of the situation room. You think about the West Wing and, and all the movies, and, oh, you get to go into the, West, into the West Wing, into the situation room and get a briefing, usually from the people in the field, about what's going on in Iraq. So we utilized that. We utilized phone calls. We utilized fact sheets. We, we sent some people into Iraq. You know, it's, it's that you get yourself to Amman and, or, or Kuwait City, and we'll get you on a C-130, and we'll send you to Iraq. And we're not just going to send you there and do the PowerPoint presentation and, and have you hit the road again, but we're going to get you into the ground. We're going to send you to one of these provincial reconstruction teams, and you're going to be able to talk to the diplomats. You're going to talk to the brigade commanders. You're going to talk to the, to the infantrymen and find out what's actually going on firsthand, not from me sitting in my office in Washington, D.C., or even from a, uh, a briefing from a commander sitting in a Pentagon press briefing, but from somebody that actually knows what's going on and has skin in the game. And it was that communication infrastructure that was set up that allowed a lot of the time to pass so that we could provide some new statistics in Iraq to show that there was some success happening. Well, also you've got to take a chance when it comes to this 50 in your engagement. So I said, well, what, a, what about the Democrats? Where, where are they? Well, they're all, they're all off. They're all gone. No, don't even try and uh, engage them. I said, well, let me, give me a chance here. Let me see what I can do. So I said, well, who's, who's the worst on this issue? Harry Reid? He's the minority leader, majority leader from Nevada? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, who's his communications director? Oh, it's this real liberal guy from Minnesota. I said, okay, well, I set up lunch with him. And we decided that we'd send all of the communicators from Capitol Hill, Republican, Democrat, who were in leadership or one of the oversight committees like Foreign Affairs or Armed Services, we'd take their communications people, we're going to load them onto a plane, and we're going to send them to Iraq and Afghanistan, and they're going to see firsthand, and they're going to get this service and this treatment. And they're going to see, and they're going to have this opportunity. A couple weeks go by, they go on the trip. Uh, I invite the Harry Reid uh, communications director. And he said, my goodness, I had no idea what the military was doing. I, I grew up, you know, none of my, fr I didn't 
joined the military. None of my none, none of my family joined the military. My direct associate of friends when I was growing up were involved in the military or foreign service. And I can't tell you that Harry Reid, the next time that he goes up, you know, he's somebody who said the war is lost. It's gone. George Bush is a liar. Some of the you know, most anti-Iraq things you can imagine. He said, I can't guarantee that that my boss is going to go on national TV tomorrow and say I was wrong, the surge is working. But I do know that there's going to be more nuance to what he says. And when I write his statements and when I prep him for interviews, he's going to talk more about what we're doing on the ground to make things better. So if you have people that are against you, engage them and try and, try and provide them with factual information, give them the access that they need, go into the no-spin zone and don't try and spin them but communicate with them. And you can turn people around to your cause. It's not easy, and it's, and it's not effective with everybody, but it can work. Use technology. Get them to the war zone. Develop your message. So part of it is, and this is what, what Kevin is very good at as well, is developing that message is gonna be, that's going to persuade people to hit on the, on the target things that are going to change behavior to what you want. In this case, it's, I want Al-Qaeda in Iraq to stop maiming, killing, and murdering innocent Muslims. I want Iraqis, regular Iraqis who are not part of the insurgency, to have a feeling of hope that there's a better tomorrow and it doesn't involve terrorism. I want the U.S. citizens to hear a message that we're doing something that's improving beyond what we were doing the five or six years before that. And I want Congress to hear, okay, fund us some more, because I think we have this. I think we have a good idea and a good operation moving forward. So tell stories to make that happen. Give those vignettes of what's going on in Iraq to find security, where U.S. forces are, are having success, where the uh, provincial reconstruction team and the embassy are working with the local Iraqi infrastructure to provide resources and to provide services and good governances and courts and opportunities and jobs. And if that can happen, and you can tell those stories and make it personal, personalize it so it hits me not just in the heart, not just in the head as a factual thing, but hit me in the heart with the emotion. And if you can do that, you can reach people and you can get to them. It has to be factual, especially in this day. What's the big thing now? It's all What's CNN, according to the White House? Fake news. It's got to be factual because there's, everybody's a fact checker and everybody has a, ha, is, is sniffing around for something that is uh, factually untrue. You've got to have it localized. You, it's got to be powerful and it's got to be relatable and then you've got to have the call to action. What do you want people to do? Now you've got them built in. Your, your messaging is, is personal. It's powerful. It's factual. It's emotional. It's relatable. What do you want them to do? Well, in the case of, of Iraq in 2007 and 8, I want the Iraqis to give a chance to the, to the government, to their local government, and maybe even a look at Baghdad. Maybe they've got a, an idea going. I want the U.S. to fund the war for a couple more months, not to have an immediate withdrawal that some people on Capitol Hill were talking about. Have that call to action. So... We used media training, we used visuals, we used real accounts, we used combat camera to tell the story with visuals. That's so important nowadays. It was, it was in 2005, uh, six, and seven, but now it's all visuals. It's all, what's the number one thing now? It's Instagram, it used, to be, it used to be Twitter. Now it's all photos, visuals, it's all videos. Find ways to tell those stories in a video component. The other thing is get your local game plan together first and foremost. If you don't have the local game plan, you have a paper tiger, paper tiger that's not going to work. So that's how we utilize the provincial reconstruction teams to integrate the Iraqi ministers. We had briefings from the military. We had briefings from the Iraqi military. I spent two days in Baghdad in February 2007 where I went and met with uh, Ali Aldabaugh. Ali Aldabaugh was the spokesman for Iraq. He was the 
who is it now? He was the Sean Spicer of Iraq, but I think with more success. And he, what he did was he, he so I went to visit him in the, in the Iraqi government complex, this huge, this huge building with chandeliers and uh, huge ceilings and all the ornament. And he's in about a 2,000 square foot huge um, um, uh, office area. It was part of one of the palaces. And he's there by himself with a laptop and a desk. He's like, Ollie, what do you need? Well, I've, it's me and my two cousins. We're running this. You've got, well, you and your two cousins? Yeah, 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 we're running the communications infrastructure for, for Iraq. You've got to man up that team, and you've got to put some, some money and some capabilities behind that and, and build it so that that can become your that can become a cornerstone of your communications infrastructure. If you don't have that, you don't have anything. And so I spent two days in his office and got him the infrastructure and the resources that he needed so that he could communicate. One thing to do is always be training as you're, as you're trying to find your, your foreign policy um, successes and find your, your opportunities and your mentors. Um, I would count Kevin as one of my mentors he was extraordinarily helpful to me. Um, find people that have been through this before. Utilize their resources. And mentors don't always have to be somebody old with gray hair. Sometimes they can be somebody young, but they know a whole lot about something that you don't know about. And I use that all the time for social media and for digital media and for how to connect to people. I mean, my, one of my mentors is a 25-year-old who knows everything about the web. And I latch on and learn, and that's going to be a huge component to how you can um, get things done. Note your successes is another thing. So as you're going through your foreign policy uh, challenge or situation, you're going to have some cornerstones that are going to come to your attention. We had one where, where I met with uh, the Wisconsin Teacher of the Year 2007. And this gentleman said... Uh, we were just talking. He said, well, what do you do? And I told him. And he said, you know what? I am a very uh, liberal um, association of teachers, teachers union member. I voted against George Bush twice. But the surge is working. I said, okay, well, maybe our messages is getting through. And that was a cornerstone to know that if, if the teacher from Wisconsin is listening to your messages and hearing it, there's probably a good chance that other people as well. So take that success and learn from it. Another time was when Charles, Charlie Gibson of World News Tonight, and the nightly news was horrible every day for years on the war in Iraq because it was terrible. And there was destruction and violence every single day, and there were reports of murders and, and, and bombings and vehicle-borne explosive attacks and, and suicide bombers every single day. And one time in October 2007, Charlie Gibson of World News Tonight said, one item from Baghdad today, there is no news. There were no major acts of violence. Now let's go to a commercial. It's like, well, maybe it is working. Maybe we are having successes. So find those things that are working, gravitate towards them, build on it, and grow it. All right, so as Kevin and I were talking before, uh, before I came up here, I, there, there's going to be an element of a bureaucracy, any bureaucracy that says we're doing that, or we don't do that. And we'd hear this all the time. Uh, we'd go to a meeting at, at the NSC or at one of the agencies or, or one of the intelligence uh, organizations, and they'd say, we'd say, we've got a huge problem here. Uh, we're, we're trying to find some, some wins and some success and some ways to utilize resources to uh, change, change behavior and change the dynamics in Iraq. And almost to a person, they would say, we're doing it. We got it. I said, well, what are you doing? Oh, well, we, we, uh, we, we've got, and, they, and they'd talk about this one item, or they'd say, well, our, our cyber campaign, we took down Al-Qaeda's network. Well, for how long? A day? Okay, and then they set it up, back up again. So find ways, dig down, and find ways to help the bureaucracy find the solutions that they needed. We, there was always a, a DOD, Department of Defense, briefing when every, every quarter, it would be that, that the, the Iraq um, uh, special investigator 
would come out with a report on how horrible uh, Baghdad is doing, how horrible Iraq is doing. And we would um, say, when, when the information was getting better, we'd say, well, can you brief that? Because you brief it when it's really, really bad, but now that it's better, now you're not briefing it. Well, nobody cares about it now. Well, but now I want people to know about it. No, we don't do that. Well, why don't you do that? Well, it's against policy. I say, well, where's, where's the policy? What's the, what's the policy exactly? Well, it's, it's not actually a policy. Uh, it's, more of a, it's, it's more of an operating procedure. Okay, well, what is, is it operate, what, what's the operating procedure? Well, okay, it's not actually, it's an operating procedure. It's just kind of the way we do things. It's like, well, help us fix this. And, and that's what a lot of times is what we would spend our time doing is finding out ways to actually accomplish what we're trying to do. And if somebody says we don't do that or, or it's against the law or it's against the regulation or it's against the SOP or it's against whatever it is, find a way. Is it really? And, you know, there's another policy out there, which is we have 140,000 troops in Iraq right now, tens of thousands of contractors, civilians that are in a war zone right now. Let's fight for them. And we took that attitude, and we were their vessel in Washington, D.C. to achieve some change that was positive. Okay, are we kind of at the point to take questions, or where are we time-wise? Okay, let, let me just give a quick, a quick uh, final thing here, and then we'll go right to it. So, as Paul Harvey would say, uh, now it's the rest of the story. So the surge, um, casualties, coalition casualties, too many, but in uh, December of 2006, there were 115. Uh, December of 2008, there were 16. That's still 16 too many. But we did find a way to bring some security in that time period to lower the amount of sectarian um, targets against civilians, casualties against U.S. forces, casualties against uh, Iraqi forces. And then there was a um, status of forces agreement that was put into effect the summer of 2000, um, or the, the winter of 2008, that says forces should be out of Iraq by December of 2011. Um, they could have renegotiated it, but President Obama and his, his campaign for president said, we're getting out, and he honored that. That's his, as, as the leader, and uh, duly elected leader, that, that was his thing. I wish he would have put some more forces on, it might have uh, stopped the possibility of ISIS, but again, I don't know for sure, but I think it, if, if we could have had some more work with the Iraqi security forces and more work with the government for a short, for a short period of time with a small amount of troops, that maybe ISIS would not have the, the stranglehold that they had over the past four years. Um, and then it's the turnover. So this is the, the last thing is turnover when you're – because the problem we have in the government is that a guy like Kevin comes in, a guy like me comes in, we go to work for a couple of years, and then we look for the next thing. And there's no continuity in this, in, in, in this operation. So find ways so that you're leaving a legacy to continue what you're doing with the next team that comes in if you're leaving to take the, on the next challenge. Because if you don't have that, it's all going to fall apart. So I met with the Obama transition person after the campaign of 2008, laid out everything that Kevin and I were doing and the whole team was doing. Here's our, here's our strategy, here's our engagement strategy, here's, our, here's, here's, how, here's how we were putting together all of our operations. And she said, thank you very much, this is very good, appreciate it. They came in and look, they, they ran on change. It wasn't change and it wasn't let's continue to operate Mark Fifeley's plan for the war in Iraq. It was we're gonna put our own team in and do our own thing. So put your operation together in a way that it can be long-term and that it can be an enduring product. The government's not good at that. We change quickly. Lastly, enjoy the experience that you're going to have. Become a happy warrior for your cause. Coordinate it. Welcome the next opportunity. And uh, find your surge. Go. Make things happen. Go win. Good luck. So thank you very much. Now we'll take...